So I would love to kick off by hearing your perspective about how Slack fits in with the shifting nature of work more generally. So when you talk to customers, how do you articulate the value of Slack? And what do you think it is that's changing about workplaces today that sets Slack up for its enormous success in such a short amount of time? Thank you for putting all of that into the question. Um, <laughs> let me talk to you about the enormous success. Um, I, I, for the first part, how do I explain it? I typically explain it poorly. And there's, um, uh, I was at an event last summer. And it was a, like a dinner, and I was taught, seated next to the CEO of a French multinational who had never heard of Slack, and he asked me about it. And I was about 90 seconds into the explanation, um, and I could tell that this, this was not landing at all, um, much too conceptual. Uh, and someone else who happened to use Slack across the table leaned over and said, it replaces email inside your company. And he said, ah, oh, OK. <laughs> um, so I think that's the most. Uh, it's, it's the simplest way of articulating what it does, um, but it takes a little bit more thought than that because people think of email as you type something in a box, you press a button, and then the text that you just typed gets sent to someone else. Um, around 80% of the email that you get isn't sent by or composed by a human. It's composed by a machine. I just made up 80%, so <laughs> for the data scientists in the room, um, that's a thing that you can do. Watch your <laughs> chief executives. Um, but it's entirely plausible, and it's going to be a, approximately that amount. And when, when I say that it's uh, composed by machines, I mean things like the receipt for your Lyft ride or your Amazon purchase. I mean newsletters that get sent out. I mean uh, reset your password links. You have to approve this expense report. Someone signed the document that you sent out. And I can keep going down this list. So for people inside of workplaces, email is often the, the window into all of the workflows across the company. It's where the... Um, the documents being negotiated uh, and the contracts being redlined by lawyers come back and forth. It's a kind of ersatz file storage system. And it, it serves a bunch of roles for which email is not particularly well suited. And um, a messaging service like Slack, which serves as a, a, a hub for collaboration across the company, is much better suited principally because the messages are organized into what we call channels. So a channel can correspond to like a, a very broad functional group. So we have one for marketing um, or for very narrow, um, small work group teams focused on an individual project. So Q3 launch of performance marketing. Um, it can be for office locations. It can be for uh, a, a management group. And the wonderful thing about channels is that it massively increases the transparency inside the organization. And just a little asterisk on that word, because it often means that in the context of business, uh, transparency means that the bosses are forthcoming with the workers. I don't mean that. I mean just literally the opposite of opacity. People can see what's going on across the organization in a way that they can't with email, because email is addressed to an individual or a group of individuals, and everyone has their own fractured um, relatively small view of what's going on across the company. Um, and to make that real, and I apologize that I said I would answer each question. It would take me a while. Um, we, have, we have channels for uh, every large customer. And at the same time um, that I was telling this French CEO about what Slack is, we were in the process of closing what's now our second biggest customer, which is Oracle. And I showed him a, a channel called accounts-Oracle. and. I didn't have to ask my team for updates on what's going on. It's a, it's a really complex process to close a deal like that. There's about 100 people on their side. It's a vendor approval process and security review and negotiating the commercial terms and working on a change management plan. And I could see the conversations that people were having and where we were at with each of those. And critically, every person on our side involved in this process could also see what their peers and colleagues were working on. And maybe even more importantly, uh, engineers across the organization who had nothing, no, no direct interaction with Oracle, but who were working on a feature uh, which was blocking the deployment in Oracle, could see the context of these conversations. So rather than this request coming in as something just like dropped from the top, no context, I don't really understand the impact, um, that they have that whole context. And that's a, that's a really powerful thing, because as our company has gotten bigger, uh, we're about 1,000 people now, so it's not a, a huge organization, but certainly much bigger than anything else I've managed before. Um, the, the theme for me has been the importance of alignment uh, and clarity for people. I mean, the, uh, I'll come back to that, I'm sure. Sorry. 
So just to, to kind of riff on the idea of transparency and information uh, being useful to employees to kind of learn and, and navigate a complex situation. Uh, so clearly, Slack kind of enables transparency and learning by allowing employees to access these channels and access a broader swath of information. But at the same time, a criticism might be levied that too much information mm -hmm. could produce data overload and make it more difficult to navigate a complex situation. So how does Slack mitigate this risk of information overload for the people that use it? Um, I might say more attenuate the effects than mitigate the risk, because it, it's, um, it's not even a risk. It, it will happen. You have access to, um, in most cases, depending on the size of the organization and the, the nature of the organization, orders of magnitude more information. And I mean that in a literal, like, arithmetic sense, um, 10, 100, 1,000 times more access to information. And you don't have to read it all. It's not being pumped into an inbox. There are channels that you can elect to join and channels that you can elect to read, even if you have joined them. Um, and we give a lot more tools for people to uh, manage that. So I mean, in terms of notification preferences, you can be a member of a channel but mute it so it doesn't show up as unread and, and therefore give you one more thing to check. Um, you know, really a comprehensive set of controls that people can have. And uh, we work very deeply on search and not just search for the retrieval of documents or messages that you know or suspect exist, which is a, you know, one big broad class of searches. I'm looking for something that I, I know uh, exists because I saw it. But also searches um, for topics that you're interested in. And every organization, every one of the, your workplaces has some internal jargon. It could be a made up word, like an acronym that is pronounced in a certain way, or it could be a regular English word that has a special meaning. So for us, we have a server side caching technology that we've developed called Flannel. And if you're an engineer at Slack, on your first day, you will hear people say Flannel. It obviously doesn't mean the, you know, the regular English meaning of the word. And so you type in Flannel into the search box, and we'll find um, people who appear to be experts on this topic, and we'll also suggest channels where it is frequently discussed. Um, I don't remember now whether we're calling that people search or expert search, but um, there's a lot that we can do by having this really large corpus of information to make it better. Um, but the, the fundamental problem, and I'm putting air quotes around it, it being a problem because I think it's, uh, it's like technology generally. It, um, there's a saying, uh, I'm gonna think of a nice way to say it, the, um, <laughs> Becoming rich doesn't make you a jerk. It just makes you more of who you already were. And I think a lot of technologies are that that's true of. It doesn't um, it doesn't have a good impact or a bad impact, but it will exaggerate uh, the uh, the the uh, characteristics or habits that are already present inside the organization. And um, I should probably memorize this, but Plato put some words into Socrates' mouth, uh, complaining about the corruption of the youth because now we have written language. Which is ridiculous. No one's going to have to memorize anything. The, it'll be intellectual rot. We'll be a society of idiots. Um, and you've seen that theme, you know, in 400 BC, and you've seen it in the 17th century and in the 19th century, and then just kind of blah 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 nonstop in the 20th century with the idiots that we're all becoming, um, up to uh, McLuhan and Neil Postman and, and beyond, and we're still talking about that today. The way I prefer to think about it, um, and again, there, there can absolutely be negative impacts of um, these massive flows of information which are profoundly influential in the lives of the people who are experiencing them, but the, the way I like to think about it on a productive side for uh, workers is it's the equivalent of giving knowledge workers um, a, or the equivalent of knowledge, for knowledge workers of giving a ditch digger a backhoe. So you can dig a lot more ditches a lot faster with a backhoe. It's a much more powerful tool. And um, to the extent that we're able to equip people with uh, the capabilities that computers are so good at and we're so lousy at, uh, computers are good at comparing 100 million things all at once and finding things that are similar. They're good at remembering things perfectly um, forever. Uh, and we're terrible at all of those things. So to the extent that we're able to offload some of those capabilities to computers, we're all better off. So artificial intelligence and machine learning are major areas of interest for modern organizations. What do you think are some of the ways in which artificial intelligence and machine learning will impact our work in the future? And I'm also interested to hear about your perspective about uh, 
the extent to which artificial intelligence actually empowers workers and mm -hmm. enables them, and the extent to which it can, to some extent, you know, extinguish some of their jobs. Yeah. Um, there was a time when both calculator and computer were job titles. So um, some jobs get taken by technology, but I think relatively few. And there's a great, uh, I wish I was smart enough to have thought of this, but uh, Benedict Evans, who's an investor in uh, the Bay Area, uh, wrote this essay where he has a couple of stills from the movie The Apartment, 1960, Jack Lemmon, Shirley MacLaine. And Jack Lemmon's character works in an insurance company, and he has an electromagnetic adding machine on his desk, and he has a typewriter. And there's people pushing carts, and they, they'll hand him sheafs of paper, and he'll look at the paper, and he'll perform some calculations, and then he'll type up the results and put them back on the cart to go off to someone else. And you, there's a shot where it's like just rows and columns of desks stretching out on this huge, like 80,000 square foot floor plate in, in, um, in New York. And what is he? He is a cell on a spreadsheet. I mean, he's literally like take data, perform calculation, hand data off. And that whole floor of this insurance company is like a worksheet. Now, I think it's a fictional insurance company. But definitely the same number of people are employed by insurance companies. But once you give them actual spreadsheets, they're working on different things. They're, they're like financial planning and analysis becomes a, a sub-discipline. You can do all these kinds of sensitivity analysis and modeling, which wasn't possible before. So. I, some of you will be around the same age I am. I just turned 45. I was right at that cusp where you were supposed to, in fact, it was mandatory for you to go buy a calculator and bring it to math class, whereas before it was, we're going to need to learn how to do long division. Um, suddenly, we're, we can do trig on our calculators, and we can move up the stack in the kind of calculations that we're uh, performing and the kinds of math that we're expected to do. I think you'll see much, much more of that. Um, and. The, maybe this is too much of a, a side topic, but I definitely do not believe in a future where AI takes all the humans' jobs, because we just we have 4,000 years of history of massive technological innovation, ones that have much more impact than I think AI will have. Um, like, I mean, to, to be clear, development of irrigation, and I mean, the, the uh, transition to an agrarian society, or the development of chemical fertilizers would probably put 70% of the world's population out of work. If it, if it happened all at once, um, and mechanization. And we, um, it, it, sometimes it, this may be unfair, but the, the concerns or the fears uh, expressed around AI kind of sound like it's um, 2,500 years ago, and people are like, Archimedes, don't tell anyone about the lever and the pulley, because that's going to put so many people out of work. Um, <laughs> we'll just do things that we couldn't do before. So we're getting a lot of questions from the audience. And it looks like folks are really interested in the intersection between Slack and corporate culture. Mm -hmm. So how would you describe Slack's company culture? And what do you think is the role of Slack in enabling corporate culture? Um, I think Slack is, is a very powerful um, instrument for affecting the kind of change that leaders uh, across the organization so not just executives, but, but any kind of leader, want to see happen. So it doesn't have any out-of-the-box impact in, in one direction or another. It certainly, uh, you know, maybe, maybe with one exception, because of the increase in transparency, the anti-pattern of uh, management, which is I withhold information as a means of exercising power or um, increasing the level of control I have in the organization, that, that becomes much more difficult with Slack. But other than that, um, it, it is a, a very uh, effective instrument, so there's something happening. There's a big acquisition or divestiture or executive change. Um, we used to be vertically integrated, and now we're not going to be, so we're moving all these things to, to suppliers. Um, and what you want in those kinds of cases is a higher degree of alignment, more clarity. Um, people have questions. You don't want to have a lot of uncertainty so that people hesitate. You want people to be able to move quickly. You want um, in almost every case, decisions to be pushed down to the, uh, the lowest level that they can be. You want people to feel autonomous and empowered. In all of those cases, um, Slack is, is a very effective way of getting people the information that they need, but also putting the decision making in a place where the right people can participate and the right people can see it. In fact, um, in, in culture generally, I know we didn't really get into this, but uh, uh, another question that, that uh, we discussed uh, before was um, the dehumanizing effect of technology. And again, 
uh, not to, he to hedge too much, but I think it could go either way. So one unexpected bit of customer feedback that we've gotten in a really consistent way, um, literally over years, and it, you know, it used to be like once every couple months, and now it's maybe once every week. Someone writes in and says, hey, I just wanted to thank you for Slack. I'm really introverted. I had a difficult time participating in conversations previously because they happen in meetings. Some of the participants are louder, more aggressive. But even if they weren't, I'd like to take a little bit more time to consider my thoughts. Because I can now participate asynchronously, I feel like I have much more input and um, I'm, I'm much more of an active participant in conversations. So you'll, you'll see that as well. Um, I, I hope, certainly, that the, um, the net impact for organizations that move from email as a primary means of internal communication to Slack is that whatever their corporate culture is or whatever cultural goals or, or aims that they have, they're easier to achieve as a result. Mm -hmm. So here's a related question from an audience member. They say, we had a long discussion on diversity yesterday. Do you ever worry that Slack channels reinforce exclusive groups rather than fostering inclusivity? Um, well, I worry about everything. I had a Jewish <laughs> grandmother, and it's kind of inculcated. So yes, um, in a literal sense, I do worry about that. Um, I, I, you know, it's, it's sort of the same theme that I've been saying. Um, technology gives you a lot more choices. I think Slack gives a lot more um, power to organizations, um, and it. If there are deep and systemic problems in that organization, they can be exaggerated. If there are real positive attributes and successful methods that these people have negotiated for how they work together, those can also be kind of supercharged. Um, so I don't think there's anything inherent to that structure. Um, we, Slack, the company, uh, headquartered in San Francisco, we have 1,000 employees, about 650 in the Bay Area, um, are uh, part of an industry that is uh, much less diverse than what, what people would like. Um, we, as a company, are, are more, much more diverse than the, the industry average. And it's definitely a, a topic internally on an ongoing basis, more about Slack the company than, than Slack the product. Um, but it does come up pretty frequently, and it is a concern that's top of mind. So I guess it, I don't, don't want to feel like I'm not really answering the question. But I don't think that there's a, any inherent design characteristics that would um, inhibit inclusivity. So here's a rather instrumental question from an audience member. Do you see future opportunities for outside people analysts to access and analyze Slack communication, parentheses, with consent? Um, <laughs> yes, with consent. We have this really, uh, um, actually right here in the audience, Noah Weiss, who heads up a group in New York called Search Learning and Intelligence, who's working on a set of organizational insights tools. Um, and it's a, it's a fraught area to a certain extent because you want people to feel empowered by the feedback that they're getting um, and, the, and the tools you're offering them without them feeling like they're being surveilled. Um, so we would like to make as much of that available to the, our customers as possible. Um, we have some rudimentary analytics built in, um, and there's a, there's a handful of APIs that people can use to, to do their own kind of querying. Um, but our plans for the next couple of years are to expand that as much as possible. And it's both um, insights about organizations, and just to give a couple quick examples, the thing that I'm most interested in as a CEO is where are their breakdowns? Where are their dysfunctional teams? Where are their real kind of like impedance mismatches or um, as a way of revealing that kind of differentials in sentiment around specific topics across the organizations. So that might be between functional groups, might be between office locations, between different management chains. But I'm also personally really interested in the idea of, of personal analytics that no one else has access to except for you and presented without any real um, value either way. But do you talk to men differently than you talk to women? Um, do you speak to subordinates differently than you speak to superiors? Do you speak in public differently than you speak in, in private? Um, and that would be, I think, very useful feedback for any employee, uh, but probably something that people would feel very uncomfortable were it shared to their peers or to their managers. So um, the consent question is really interesting, and there's, uh, we're, we often, feel a, a little bit um, 
I don't want to present us as a victim, but like stuck in the middle in these conversations about um, access to information because m most of our large enterprise customers, most of our corporate customers have employment agreements which already um, uh, grant them rights or access to all employee communication. Um, so if the result of that is not, hey, it turns out that you're a jerk and therefore we're firing you, but hey, it turns out that we've identified some systemic problems around communication or uh, management structure or kind of um, organizational design which inhibits or impedes the kind of progress that we're hoping to make and therefore we rectify them, um, that's good. And I think people often forget, um, and this is a great audience for this um, message, there's a huge degree of overlap between to what the bosses want and what the workers want. Um, what Talk to any executive and what do they want? They want people to move quickly, to feel engaged, to, um, to operate in alignment, to have the uh, autonomy to make decisions, um, and that's also what people want. So, like, this is not based on any survey data or um, or any science, but just anecdotally, the message that I have personally heard over my life of well, what is it to be disaffected um, or disenfranchised or to feel alienated from the workplace, it's typically, I have so much to contribute and this job does not call on me to contribute very much or there are not opportunities to exercise my skills or abilities. Um, and if that's the problem from the perception of the employee, that's definitely the problem from the perception of the manager or the executive, um, because wouldn't you like to get the most out of people? Wouldn't you like them to be able to contribute the most? So um, yes, with consent, uh, that's something that we're really excited about, and we're also really excited about the impact of that, and something to, to um, be you know, a little cautious and conservative in um, the extent to which those kinds of things are rolled out, but I'm very optimistic about the power of those in the long term. Mm -hmm. So going back to the product, how do you measure productivity and outcomes for your clients beyond relying on mere usage data? Yeah, it's, that's a really hard one. So the, the, here's the short answer, we ask them. Um, and that's, we did a, a pretty big survey, but we had uh, 1,629 respondents. This is more than a year and a half ago now. And the weighted average response to the question, how much more productive a Slack made your company, was 32%. So that's probably not true. Like it, for those of you who have a background in econometrics, that would be like a couple decades of accumulated productivity gains, given the way things have gone for the last 30 years. Um, but that's the perception that people have, which is good for us. Um, and uh, I, it, there's some parts of working life and some parts of what people do, where well, I definitely think that is true. Certainly, if you imagine, uh, actually, I should have asked this at the beginning. How many people here actually use Slack like on a daily basis? Wow. So like 40-ish percent, maybe 50 percent. Um, I'm not a CEO, so I can't throw yeah. out percentages. OK. okay. <laughs> well, yeah, I, but I feel completely comfortable just making stuff up all the time. As long as it seems plausible, it worked. <laughs> um, for many of you, I hope, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands because I don't want to be embarrassed, uh, you feel like were it taken away, it would have a real negative impact on the, um, your ability to operate. And I don't just mean because like now you can't send each other messages because you would inevitably find some other way to do that. Um, and uh, to the extent that we're actually able to measure that, uh, it would be enormous because then we would put it on billboards all over the country and in research papers and get it in front of all kinds of executives. So uh, we're eager for better ways to measure that. What a great audience for measuring that. Please help us. <laughs> so with more companies creating collaboration products, how do you see Slack evolving to stay different and better? Um, so there's, I don't know that there's anything aside from the commitment and the effort that goes into it. So um, the effort part is, you know, we should be operating as a company at the highest possible level, so we should be as, as productive and as effective as possible. Um, and the, the commitment, so the company's mission is to make people's working lives simpler, more pleasant, and more productive. And it's suitably modest because um, tech companies often get mocked for saying they're going to change the world. And the first episode of HBO's Silicon Valley was the guy standing up and saying, we're changing the world through 
protocol neutral message transport or something like that. And um, we definitely don't want to feel inauthentic when we speak internally about the company's mission. Um, but hidden in that is to increase the productivity of all the people who are using it. And um, you know, now we're at the point where there's uh, more than 10 million weekly active users. It's growing very quickly. Um, there's a, a large impact that it already has in academia, in the corporate world, um, in governments. But you see Slack use also you know, not just in, like in, in media companies and technology companies, but on farms and in dental offices and, and in all kinds of situations uh, which we never really imagined when we, we designed the product. Um, so that commitment to you know, having the impact that we would like to have, the simpler, more pleasant, and, and more productive, um, is something that I hope will sustain us against all kinds of competitive threats. I will say, though, um, this is a brand new category. The advantages, and again, I'm not going to ask for hands up because I don't want to be embarrassed, but um, the advantages to me are so obvious that the replacement of email as a means of internal communication by Slack and Slack-like things, so the movement from email to channels, um, is inevitable. It will definitely happen. Um, it will be between five and 10 years because it's, it's just so much more of an effective way to organize internal communication that um, that change will be inevitable. Not 100% of people are going to end up using Slack in that scenario. Um, many people will use other products, but that change is going to happen. So there's obviously going to be a learning curve for companies introducing any kind of new technology to their employees. Do you think that there's a risk that moving to Slack for communications could disadvantage older workers who have less familiarity or comfort with a messaging platform like yours? Um, I think that's a good concern for um, for the management of companies who are making the transition to keep in mind. I don't think there's anything inherent. Um, there, there's uh, no, I think of the right way to say this. Um, I don't think that there's any features that have like a cognitive age limit built into them. Um, and certainly my own experience um, uh, is that there's a lot of people who are older who have surprising proficiency um, if you're not paying attention to the stuff with all kinds of tools. Um, and uh, it, it might take longer for different populations, and I would say older people included, not because they're old and there's some cognitive deficit that they're suffering from, but because just familiarity. So if you're, uh, I had this experience a couple of years ago, almost all of you have had it. If you have teenagers, you've definitely seen it. But I was behind someone in the jetway boarding an airplane and there's like a 17-ish year old girl and she probably performed like 400 interactions on Snapchat <laughs> while we were in the queue. It was like a professional <laughs> operator and I don't think she kept any uh, image up on screen for more than 500 milliseconds. So it's like, like, a, it's like a, you took a music video and then pressed fast forward and it was just so um, you take someone like that and, and move them to Slack, they're going to get it much more quickly. Um, but it's not like anyone else. It's going to take months or years to figure it out. Um, I think it's going to take days or weeks. So what kinds of decisions do you rely on analytics most for? And which do you tend to rely more on intuition or personal judgment? <sighs> this is a question that comes up all the time. And I think that there's um, uh, let me preface this by saying that my academic background is in history and philosophy of science. And I think that there's an idolatry of science generally among people who are more educated um, and a, a preference for things that can be expressed numerically, which introduces a cognitive bias where people over index on the importance of a number, which is not to say that analytics is important. I think it's critically important. But the like, true progress in science is very slow very incremental, a true hypothesis that you can falsify is generally not going to be a whole big theory of management all at once. It's going to be um, uh, very small. So um, I have, and I don't know if this is a good thing to say or not, but I'll say it anyway. Um, in, in the product design part of the company, um, data will not settle any interesting questions. And both of those words that I emphasize are really important. So it will settle all kinds of um, less significant questions. Should the button be blue or green? Should it be up or down? Should we use this phrase or that phrase? Um, and it will not settle, but will have invaluable input into the interesting questions. Should we 
go down this uh, one-way door, which is way too complex to simulate or to model or to, to um, use data to, to make the decision for us. Um, and I think the same thing is true in management. And it's often uh, ineffectively optimistic, is the best way I can put it, to imagine that you can take a really difficult decision. Should we sell off this part of the company? Um, should I hire this marketing executive versus that marketing executive? Should we reorganize in, in the following way and expect that you're going to be able to you know, put some numbers in and then press a button and then the computer is going to tell you what the answer is? However, um, uh, there's all kinds of inquiries one can make and data that one can analyze which are really important in informing that decision. So I don't think it's fair to say that it's just intuition. And last thing, because we're out of time, um, the power of intuition, um, I think, is massively undersold. Um, the, our ability to recognize human faces from like a tiny, yeah, computers can do this better than us, um, but to, <laughs> from, a, from a tiny little bit of our visual field or to recognize the voices of people that we um, already know, that's intuition in a sense. It's the synthesis of a bunch of perceptual apparatus that has been trained over the course of years or decades. Um, and we have exactly the same uh, capabilities when it comes to decision making in all kinds of domains. <laughs> so we have one comedian in the room and I'll let their question be the last question. All right. Uh, so a lot of folks raise their hand when you ask who in the room is regularly, regularly using Slack. Yep. And someone asks, does it bother you that a lot of those people who raise their hands might be paying more attention to their Slack feed than to this talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Um,